The Green Bottle by Bernard Capes Read by Bethina My knowledge of Sewell was principally of a fox-nosed, weedy, scorbutic youth who wrote four to the pound pars for the daily record. Further, I bore in mind his flaccid palms, his drooping underjaw, and the way in which, in Fleet Street bars, he would hang, looking indeed rather like a wet towel, on the words of any Captain Bobadil of his craft who would condescend to wipe his boots on him or, for the matter of that, his foul mouth. He had no principles, I think. He was born lacking the sentiments of pride and decency. If he was kicked into the mud, he would make, before rising, a little conciliatory gift of mud pie for the kicker. On close terms with the petty ailments of his own body, the secret discoveries that delighted him were of similar weaknesses in others. The prescriptively unmentionable was his humour's best inspiration. His belief in the real approval underlying the affected disgust of his hearers quite genuine. He was, in short, a sort of editor's pimp, with all the taste and the instinct to procure copy in the detestable sense. At one time he elected, to my sorrow, to attach himself to me, with this justification, from his point of view, that I then happened to be grinding my literary barrel organ, always adaptable to the popular need, to the tune of a contemporary interest in the problems of criminology, and the mudlark, being himself of a Newgate complexion of mind, had the assurance, in consequence, to assume a sympathetic bond between us. Now, the difficulty being to convince Sewell that decency was ever anything but a diplomatic pose, and that one did not pursue vice, as dogs hunt foxes, because of the mere bestial attraction to an abominable scent, but with the sole purpose to reach and end the offence. I was led more contemptuously than wisely into allowing the assumption of claim by default, with the result that for some weeks the unsavoury thing stuck to me like a jigger. Then, at the climax of the annoyance, just when I had resolved as an anthropological economy upon dissecting my torment or himself as the closest possible illustration of my meaning, of a sudden the creature vanished, disappeared sans phrase, and Fleet Street and the Daily Record knew no more. The fact was that Mr Sewell had been left a competence and had retired into private life. I did not see the fellow again for some 18 months, when one afternoon he visited me quite unexpectedly at my lodgings. He accepted, as of old, the finger I committed to his clasp, and which I then, hardly covertly, under my desk, wrenched dry between my knees. He was scarcely altered in appearance. The only accent of difference that I could observe was in his tie, which was a spotted, burglarious-looking token in place of the rusty black wisp that had been wont to depend loosely knotted from his neck. For the rest, he was the slack, unwholesome figure with the sniggering and inward manner of my knowledge, and yet, scanned again, there was something unusual about him after all, a suggestion, it might be, of excited nervousness, such as one might imagine in a very fulsome Paul Pry bursting, while fearing to retail a ticklish piece of scandal. Well, I said, after some indifferent commonplaces, so you've got your ticket of leave, and aren't your fingers itching in a vacuous freedom for Oakham and the Fleet Street crank again? Oh, Mr. Deering, says he, tittering and twisting, I like the metaphor. I come to report myself to you, Mr. Deering. Hm, said I. Well, when all said, how do you manage to kill time? Why, I kill it, says he, grinning. 
and I lay it out. It's only necessary to have an object in life, Mr. Deering. Mine's killing time, that I may lay it out. You'll never guess what I've become. I'll make one shot. A body snatcher. <laughs> Not far wrong. A collector, Mr. Deering. I wish you'd come and see my museum. Will you have dinner with me tonight? Not to be thought of. See here and here. In fact, I've already given you longer than I can spare. Goodbye till our next meeting. I'm on the jury. I'll try to forget the worst I know of you. He rose, fidgeted, still lingered. I do wish you'd dine with me. I tell you I can't. Besides, I'm particular. It's a fad of mine about my alimentary atmosphere. An unwholesome one balks my digestion. I began to be annoyed that the fellow would not go. Suddenly he turned upon me with more decision than he had yet shown. The fact is, something, something very odd has happened. Quite impossible, you'd say. I don't know. If you'd only come and look. I did look at him in surprise. Odd, that concerns me. Why not tell me now, then? You never believe unless you saw. Saw? Saw what? Why, I'm hanged if, by the jaw of you, you aren't thinking to come the supernatural over me. Yes, he said, fawningly persistent. I want you to see. It's a case of horrors or nothing. You'll be able to judge, as you've made it your line. I've done no such thing. I never raised a banshee yet that would deceive so much as a psychist. Well, said he, that's another inducement. You'd not be predisposed to the infection. Infection, I shouted. What the devil? You've not been laying out in earnest. He wriggled over a laugh. No, said he, I meant the infection of fear. Oh, trust me there, said I. There was so far a concession that, under the stimulus of a curiosity, the creature had succeeded in arousing in me. I presently accepted, though grudgingly, his invitation. Then he took himself away, and I went on with my work, rather peevishly, for there was a bad taste in my mouth that I endeavoured unsuccessfully to neutralise with tobacco. At seven o'clock, I packed away and went, depressed, to keep my engagement. It was a July evening of that unsavoury closeness that paints faces with a metallic sweat and vulgarises out of all picturesqueness the motley concerns of life. An evening when fat women are truculent at omnibus doors, when the brassy twang of piano organs blends indescribably with the sour stench of the roads, when a dive into a sequestered bar brings no consequence as a virtue refreshed, but rather as a self-indulgence rebuked with an added dyspepsia. And, appropriate to the atmosphere, my goal was in that inferno of dreary unfulfilments, Notting Hill. Thither I made my way, and there, in the end house of a stuccoed and lifeless-looking terrace, converted by a Salvation Army missionary one might, from its vulgarity, suppose, into flats, came presently to a stop. There was a bill to let in the ground floor window from which, by inference, my host was engaged to the upper rooms. He himself greeted me at the front door to which I had mounted by a dozen of ill-laid steps. A second door within, set in a makeshift partition, opened straight upon the stairway that led up to his quarters. "'I hope you won't object to a cold collation, Mr Deering?' said he. The stairs were so steep and he looked so down upon me, twisting about from the height at which he led, that his white face seemed to hang like a clammy stone gargoyle from the gloom. I wouldn't suggest it's what you're accustomed to, he said, but when one's only slavey goes out with the daylight and doesn't return till the milk... It can't be helped, you know. It's all right, I said brusquely and rudely enough, to be sure. 
I never supposed you kept a retinue. You're the only soul in the house, I conclude. We had come up to a landing where the stairs gave a wheel and went up, carpetless, steeper than ever. Looking aloft, it was some unmeaning comfort to me to observe that a skylight, obscured by dirt, took the slope of the ceiling with a wan sheen as a phosphorescence. Two doorways, a step or so apart, faced us entering upon the landing. Through the nearest of these I caught glimpse of a white tablecloth and our meal set upon it. The second, the further door, that was opposite the turn of the stairs, was shut. Eh? said Sewell, with a curious intonation. The only soul, eh? Well, upon my word, I won't answer for that. What the devil do you mean? I exclaimed irritably. Why, he answered, propitiatory at once, the rooms below are tenantless, if that's what you refer to. What else should I refer to? To be sure, to be sure, he answered. Oh, yes, I'm the only one in possession. I don't mind. Generally speaking, there may be something now and again that makes a difference, you know, but generally speaking, I think I've got the collector's love of solitude. We sort of hug ourselves over our finds, don't we? And then it isn't nice to have somebody else by, eh? That's my museum, that second door. I'd like you, if you don't mind, just to go cursorily round it now, before we sit down, and see what sort of an impression it makes on you. Is your rotten mystery connected with it? Well, yes it is. Lead on then, and let's get it over. He obeyed, opening the door gingerly to its full width before entering, as if he half expected something to be there before him. I uttered an instant grunt. A row of unclean faces, their upper prominences so covered with dust as to give one the impression of their posturing over some infernal kind of footlights, leered down upon us from the top of a high bookcase. Yes, said Sewell, though I had not spoken to him. They're a pretty lot, aren't they, Mr. Deering? I picked them up at the Vandal sale, the lunatic specialist, don't you remember, that went mad and cut his own throat in the end. I don't know half their stories, but when I'm in the mood, I sit here and try and piece them out of their faces. That fellow with the fat whale on his neck now. Oh, shut your imagination, you anthropophagist. Here, we'll hurry up with this. I see, I see, absolutely characteristic, and I might have guessed the bent of your virtuosity. I found a precursor inspection more than sufficient. The creature had only found himself out of independence. He was become, logically, an old Bailey curioso. His collection disposed about the shelves of that same bookless bookcase, and on little tables and whatnots, ranged from housebreaker's tools miracles of vicious elegance, to a slip from a C.C. open spaces seat, on the branch of a tree above which a suicide had hanged himself. There were murderous revolvers together with the bullets extracted from their victims. There were knives, lengths of Newgate rope, last confessions, photographs and blood stains. and inviting me to the discussion of this garbage, Sewell, I believe, was actuated by no inhumanity of malevolence. An unnatural appetite is normal to itself, I suppose. But all the time his manner was distrait, spasmodic, watchful, and not of me, I could have thought. All at once I felt myself constrained to rise from an examination and walk to the window. It looked to the sordid backs of other converted houses. It looked down into a well of a garden choked with rank grass, from the jungle of which stiff ears of dockweed stood up, as if picked to the French casement that I could not see in the room below. Now the tall buildings so blocked out the sunset that, although day still ruled, the room in which we stood was already appropriated to a livid twilight. I tugged at the window, striving to open it. "'What are you trying?' 
cried Sewell. What are you up to? What's the matter with you? He hurried across the room. He looked curiously into my face as if for confirmation of some hope or fear of his own. You can't do it, he said. It's been nailed up. Look here, Mr. Deering. We'll feed, shall we? Yes, I snarled. I was furious with myself. I walked out of the room as still as and bristling like a baited cat. For the moment I was exalted above the impulse to put my tail between my legs. Sewell's cold collation was vile. I swear it, though no sybarite, in some explanation of a subsequent nightmare. Macbeth hadn't supped when he saw the ghost of Banquo. How many ghosts he would have seen after a slice of Sewell's steak pie is conjectural. At the fourth mouthful, I put down, I might have dietetically, with scarce more discomfort to myself, my knife and fork. Is that beastly door shut? I said crossly. He knew, without my explaining, that I meant the door of the museum. Yes, he answered, impervious to my rudeness, and offered no further remark. But perhaps, from a like sentiment of oppression, he turned up the gas above the table. I made another effort at the pie, and finally desisted. Look here, I said, falling back in my chair and streaking down the damp hair on my forehead. I'm not a fool. Do you hear? I'm not a fool. I say, I want to know, that's all. What the devil's a matter with that bottle? Ah! he breathed out with a curious under-inflection of relief, of triumph. The bottle, yes. I thought you'd come to it. Did you indeed? So that's your Asian mystery? Yes, that's it, he said quietly. You found it out, Mr Deering, and I wasn't mistaken, it seems. Mistaken? I, I don't know. What's the matter with it? What infernal trick have you been planning? Take care! I said, bullyingly. Shall we go and look at it again? He only answered with the soft question. I half rose, fought with myself, yielded and dropped back. I'm damned if I do, I said, until you've told me. Very well, he replied, slinkingly moved to govern and applaud me in a breath. I'll tell you at once, Mr Deering. He felt in his inner breast pocket, producing a memorandum book, withdrew a newspaper cutting from it, rose and, crossing to me, placed the slip in my hand. Accepting it sullenly and taking my reason by the ears, I forced that to focus itself on the lines. They were headed and ran as follows. The Lambeth Tragedy Mr Hobbins, the South Western District Coroner, held an inquest yesterday on the body of Ephraim Ellis, glass blower, who, as has been stated, fell down dead at the very moment that the officers of justice entered the premises of his employers, Messrs Mackay, to arrest him on suspicion of having caused the death of Francis Riddick, a fellow workman. Ellis, it will be remembered, was actually engaged in blowing bottles at the moment of his arrest. A verdict of death from syncope, resulting on shock, was returned. Sewell stood behind me as I read. His long, ropey claw slid over my shoulder and a finger of it traced along the words, It will be remembered. Yes, I muttered in response to the unspoken query. I recollect reading something about it. What then? Sewell's finger went on five, six letters and stopped. He was blowing bottles, he said. He was, Mr Deering. I was standing by him at the time and he was blowing that very green bottle you saw on the table in the next room. Do you know how they do it? They dip the end of their pipe into the melting pot that sits in the furnace and then, having rolled the little knob, they fished up tube-shaped on an iron plate and pinched it for a neck. They take and blow it into a brass mould until it fits out the shape of the thing. Then they open the mould and the bottle comes free, but stuck to the pipe until a touch with a cold iron snaps the two apart. That's the way 
But this bottle, you'll say, has a neck like a retort. I'll tell you why, Mr Deering. Ellis had just blown the thing complete when the policeman put a hand on his shoulder. The pipe was at his mouth. He gave a last gasp into it and went down, the soft bottleneck bending and sealing itself as the falling pipe dragged it over. Very well. I'd known the man and something of his story and brought away the green bottle just as he'd left it for a memento. But Mr Deering, I brought away that in it that I hadn't bargained for. Can't you guess what it was? A uh, no. Why, Ellis's soul, Mr Deering, that passed into it with that last gasp of his and was sealed up for anyone that likes to let it out. I got to my feet, driven beyond endurance. You ass, I cried. Have you drivelled to an end? Oh dear, no, he whispered with a little nervous but defiant chuckle. Now you know, don't you, Mr Deering, that there's something uncommon about, about that out there. Perhaps you'll be able to explain it. It was in the hope that I asked you, who've made such a study of psychological phenomena, to endure my company for a night and to tell you the truth. There's something more and worse. Wouldn't you like to hear about it, Mr Deering? Oh, go on, I said with a groan. I've accepted my company, as you say, and won't you come further from the door? He asked, truckling to and hating me, as I believed. I can see you aren't comfortable, and no wonder. I ground my teeth on a curse and, slouching to the mantelpiece, put my back against it. A blue bottle, droning heavily in labour, whirled about the room and settled with a buzzing flop on the pie. The succession of its fulsome chaunt seemed to embolden unseen things to stir and giggle in the dark corners of the room. "'Aren't you going on?' I said desperately. Yes, he answered, I'm going on. From first to last, I'll tell you everything, and then you can form your own conclusions. Mr Deering, I'd got to know, as I said, the man Ephraim Ellis. How don't particularly matter. I'm fond of prowling about at night. I make acquaintances and pick up things that interest me. This man did. There was something suggestive about him, something haunted, as I'd like to put it. He kept company at one time with a slavey of mine that died of fits. I've seen her in them. And perhaps that led to my following him up to his workplace and getting into talk with him. He was a glass blower and on night duty. A queer customer he was, and dark and secret as sin. Sometimes I'd look at him red and shifty in the glow and I'd think, are you calculating the consequences, my friend, of braining me with a white-hot bottle? He may have been more than you'd fancy, for I believe the man took me for an unclean spirit, sent to goad him to further desperations. Further, I say, but mind you, I only go by report. It would never do, would it, Mr Deering, for you and me to be certain, or they might claim us for accessories. I broke into a hoarse, angry exclamation. No, no, he interrupted me hurriedly. Of course they couldn't. It was only my fun, but the truth is... Ellis's fellow workmen were fully persuaded that Ellis had murdered Riddick, who had been found one morning after he'd relieved Ellis at solitary night duty with his head melted and run away against the door of a furnace. I don't know and I don't know what they went upon, seeing the trunk was all right and that there was no head to examine for trace of injuries. But they made out their suspicions on technical grounds, I suppose, and as to the moral, 
Why, Riddick, by their showing, had been a taunting devil, a regular bad lot, who had made a game of baiting Ellis till he drove the man almost to madness. Anyhow, Ellis was marked down by them and given the cold shoulder of fear, and so he worked apart, for he was too valuable a hand to be dismissed. He worked apart with only me, I really believe, in the whole wide world to speak to him until the police, acting upon rumours, or the shadows of them, came to lay hands on him. But now, I must tell you, before that happened, there was something else occurred that was more intimate to the moral, if not to the circumstantial point. Ellis took to having fits or seizures in which he'd raved that Riddick hadn't been got rid of after all, but that he'd all of a sudden be there again and burrowing into him and hanging on inside like a bat under ivy, while he'd whisper into his soul's blasphemies not fit to be mentioned. He'd not lose his senses, what he'd got of them in these states, but he'd sit down staring with a face on him as if he'd swallowed a live eel. Sometimes I could have burst with laughter at the sight, and then, once upon a time, Mr. Deering, he took me all in a moment into his confidence, as I may say, and it was like a deathbed confession, for that night the police came and finished him. I had been standing by watching him at work when he broke off for a drink of water. The common tap was in a little yard at the back of the premises and he went out to it. I fancied he beckoned me to follow him. Anyhow, I did and faced him there under the starlight. I'm only speaking of three nights ago, so you may believe the whole thing sticks pretty vividly in my memory. He glanced up as I stood before him. Why do you follow me? He says in a low voice. Why do you come and stand there and look at me? Are you Riddick? My God, I'll melt your head like wax if you are, says he. Why, Mr Ellis, says I, taken aback, till I jumped to the humour of the thing. If Riddick grips you, as he has done, while I'm looking on, I can't be Riddick, can I? No, that's true, he says. What do you want with me then? And, oh my God, he says in such a Hamlet's ghost voice as would have set you sniggering. Can you stand by and see a soul raving in the grip of damnation and not offer to help it? Mr Ellis, I answered, does Riddick really come to you like that? He comes and clutches me, he said, and he clutched me when he was alive. He holds me and claims me to his own wickedness, and I must listen and listen and can't get away. I want to escape, and he clings on and whispers, and if I strike him down and melt his bloody battered face into glass... There he is in a little while, up and at my soul again, struggling with it in my throat, lest it get away from him, and fly free with some last breath I put into my work. He looked at me in a death's head kind of manner, and I had a business, as you may guess, Mr Deering, not to explode in his face. Well, after a minute, he turns round with a groan and goes back to his work. And I followed, as you may suppose. Now, he was at his bottles once more and me standing by him when all of a sudden he put down his pipe and his face was like soapy pumice stone. He's entering into me. He's got me again. He whispered in a voice like choking. Go on with your work. As if you didn't know, says I. Choking too, though for a different reason. Then you'll be able to take him off his guard and blow him out into a bottle. I thought that was too tall even for his reach. But, Mr Deering, would you believe it? The mug actually made a run and scrambled to do as I told him. Only I suppose Riddick was holding on so tight that when he blew, the two, himself and the other, came away together. Anyhow, there's the consequences in the next room, sealed and untouched, as it was left from the corpse's mouth. For the police took him while he was near bursting himself over that, the very last bottle he was ever to mould. 
He brought himself to a stop with a feculent chuckle. Then, what you'll judge it to be, I can't tell, he went on. It's as funny as fits, whatever it may mean. I know for myself I'd sooner sit and watch it on the right side of the glass than I would a little fish in an aquarium setting himself to catch and loose and catch again and suck down by fractions a huge wriggling worm. I came away from the mantelpiece. The room seemed a swimming vortex. I have a notion that I curse Sewell for an unnameable carrion. But if I did, my loathing and horror hit him without effect. I can only remember that we were in the museum again, that dusk had gathered there, heavy and opaque, and then suddenly Sewell had lit a candle and was holding it behind the thing on the table while he invited me with a gesture to advance and inspect. It was an ordinary claret bottle, but distorted at the neck. The light struck into it and through it, and I looked and saw that its milky greenness was in never-ceasing motion. There they are, whispered Sewell gluttonously. Look, Mr. Deering, mightn't it be the worm and the fish now? A little palpitating, shuddering blot of terror, human and inhuman, now distended as if gasping in a momentary respite, now crouching and hugging itself into a shapeless ball, and always steadily and tiringly followed and sprung upon by the thing that had the appearance th through the semi-opaque glass. Of a shambling, fat-lidded... Something gave in me, and with a sobbing snarl, I caught the bottle up in my hand. Mr. Deering, cried Sewell, Mr. Deering, what are you going to do? Stand back, I shrieked, stand back. He ran round at me with a little nervous gobble of laughter. Don't, he cried, let's take it away and bury it. He caught at my arm, but I flung him aside madly, and with all my force, dashed the horror to the floor. A moment's silence succeeded the ringing crash. Oh, whispered Sewell, giggling. Listen, it's going up the stairs after the other. There's something beating on the skylight. I tore onto the landing. There was a sound as if some sprawling, bloated body were climbing the bare treads in a series of scrambling flops. Higher it might have been a great moth that fluttered frenziedly against the glass. The cord of the skylight hung down to my hand. I wrenched at it demonically, and the glass above swung open with a scream. A whir receding into the faint, stinging whine of a distant organ vibrated overhead and was gone. Something on the upper stairs, something unseen and shocking, turned and began to descend towards me. And at that I wheeled and rushed, staggering for escape and release, leaving Sewell to finish conclusions with what remained. That was The Green Bottle by Bernard Capes, published in 1902 and read by the request of one of my listeners, a fellow appreciator of Bernard Capes' rather sinister stories. I hope you enjoyed it. Please remember to click the like button and subscribe to my channel for more such stories. If you look at my channel, you'll find an audiobook playlist in which there are some more stories by Bernard Capes. And as always, thank you for listening.